86th Psalm. Again, reading verse number 1, the Bible says, Bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Boy, have you ever been there? Boy, there's been times that I needed the Lord to show up and help me. Verse number 2, Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Let's pray. Our Father, we sure do bless you. We thank you for the good singing. Lord, our hearts have been blessed this morning. Thank you for a good Sunday school hour. Thank you for good reports from the jail services. Thank you for being a good God. David said you're good, and Lord, you have proven that time and time again throughout the ages. Lord, we thank you for this day that has befallen us. We thank you that, Lord, we can be in the house of God this morning. I do pray for those that are sick and afflicted, couldn't be here. Those that are providentially hindered, you'd be with them. God, we certainly pray for Brother Jeff Davis and his family. You would comfort them and undergird them with your grace. Lord, I do pray, Lord, for Miss Penny's family. God, I pray for her dear mother. You would touch her and help her. Now, Father, for the next few minutes, we pray you'd put a hedge about us. We know the devil would like nothing better than to distract or disrupt in the service. But, Lord, we know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we're leaning on thine understanding this morning. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you to rest our attention. And I pray you to rest the heart of maybe some wayward soul amongst us today, not ready for eternity. Father, we pray that you'd be high and lifted up. We pray, Father, that you'd be glorified and magnified. Now, use this unworthy vessel... Put a watch guard about my lips. Help me not to say anything contrary to the word or will of God. But, Father, help me to say everything that you'd have me to say this morning. God, speak to hearts, and we'll thank you for what you do, for it's in the wonderful and holy and glorious name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Amen. This is a psalm of David. I want you to notice several things about David. I want you to notice, uh, first of all, David's cry. Verse number 1, again it says, Bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. It's a cry of desperation. And my dear friends, he's in a situation to where it does not look good. He's in a situation where it looks helpless and he's almost hopeless. But he does have hope in the Lord. Uh, and as a cry of desperation, he calls upon the Lord, Brother Bob, uh, with confidence that God will hear his prayer. We see his cry of desperation. We see his chase for direction. I don't know about you, but there have been times when I just needed the Lord to show me the way. Look what David says in verse number 10. He says, For thou art great, and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. He goes on to say in verse 12, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. But he's seeking the Lord for direction. He's asking the Lord to teach him his way. Notice the interesting phrase. He says, unite my heart to fear thy name. He's wanting his heart to be united with God. I wonder if we came to church this morning wanting our hearts to be in unison with God. Mm. You know, I understand we just had a holiday. Uh, you probably didn't eat as much as I did. But anyway, if you're not careful, you'll get your mind on the course of events. You'll even come to church and have, not even have your heart on God, let alone want your heart to be in unison with God. We see his cry of desperation. We see his chase for direction. But notice his call for deliverance. Five times in this chapter, we see the term mercy. In verse number 3, he says, Be merciful unto me. In verse number 5, he says that the Lord is plenteous in mercy unto all that call upon him. 
And uh, we find also in verse number 13, it says, For great is thy mercy towards me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. We find in verse 15, it says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. And then in verse 16, he says, O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. We see a call for deliverance. He is calling for the mercy of God to be upon his life. Now, the word mercy means withholding from us what we rightly deserve. Now, grace is us getting what we don't deserve. But mercy is withholding from us what we do deserve. Aren't you glad God doesn't give us what we deserve? If we all got what we deserve, we'd be in hell today. But he doesn't give us what we deserve, even on a daily basis. There's many times we deserve the chastening rod of God, but we don't get that. We get mercy. Thank God for mercy. Now, I'm interested in verse 13 this morning. In verse number 13 again, he says, For great is thy mercy toward me. And if you're honest this morning, you'd say the same thing. God's mercy has been great towards you. Mm -hmm. We're breathing God's air. We're walking on God's footstool. Everything you have came from the hand of God. God's been good to all of us. But then he goes on to say, And thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Now, he denotes being delivered from hell. But throughout this psalm, he's asking for deliverance. What's he wanting to be delivered from? His enemies. His enemies are round about him, about ready to overtake him. And David's crying for the mercy of God, for strength. We're talking about the champion of Israel. is crying for God's mercy once again. My dear friends, you and I may have overcome great obstacles in our life, but we need God's mercy every day. But I'm interested in that phrase, the lowest hell. And I'm going to preach on an unpopular subject today, one that most preachers don't preach on anymore. But you know me, I'm not afraid to preach on anything. I preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. But yesterday, God spoke to my heart and said to preach on hell. And I want to preach on that thought right there, the lowest hell. I read a, an excerpt from an old book, and this excerpt doesn't even have an author to it, Brother Jim. But listen to what he had to say. He said, there is no way to describe hell. Nothing on earth can compare with it. No living person has any real idea of it. No madman in wildest flights of insanity ever beheld its horror. No man in delirium ever picture a place so utterly terrible as this. No nightmare racing across a fevered mind ever produces a terror to match the mildest hell. No murder scene with splashed blood and oozing wound ever suggested a revulsion that could touch the borderlands of hell. Let the most gifted writer exhaust his skill in describing this roaring caverns of unending flame, and he would not even brush in fancy the nearest edge of hell. Hell was originally prepared for the devil and his angels, not for man. Little wonder that there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. He is saved, redeemed, rescued. It makes the hearts in heaven glad. I got to thinking about the lowest hell. Notice what the Bible says about hell. Again, nobody likes to preach on hell, but it's a Bible thing. And I'm not interested in my opinion or anyone else's opinion about hell. I'm interested in what God said about it. Hmm? There have been famous evangelists said there's no fire in hell, yet Jesus said there was. I'm interested in what the Lord says. I want you to notice, first of all, there's the pit of hell. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 9, verse number 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven under the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. 
Can I say Luke 8 says this about the pit of hell? The pit is commonly referred to as the abyss. And in Luke chapter number 8, when Jesus meets the madman of Gadara, who's possessed with many demons, uh, and Jesus delivers and recovers this man of the demons, this is uh, 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 the conquest of the story. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many de devils were entered into him. And they, the devils, besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep or the pit, the bottomless pit. Why? Second Peter chapter 2, verse number 4 tells us, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Once something is in the pit, the bottomless pit, it doesn't come out. Amen. Can I say there's the pit of hell? Can I say also there's the pain of hell? In Luke chapter 13 and verse 28 says, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Luke 16, the rich man that died and went to hell said, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, uh, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. There is the pain of hell pain that you and I cannot associate with. Uh, imagine, if you would, having third-degree burns all over your body, but no soothing oil or ointment. Imagine, if you would, being struck with venom that uh, sends a sting throughout your veins, uh, 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 excruciating pain, but there is no relief for the venom. Imagine, if you will, uh, 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 the pain uh, uh, so intense that just one drop of water would cool your tongue from the flame. Can I say, in hell, it's outer darkness. You cannot see anything, but yet you're hearing constantly the screams of those in pain. So much agony, Brother Josh, that it says there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Uh, uh, people try to uh, uh, chew on their own flesh to dull the pain, but yet relief never comes, Brother James. Pain so intense that even the scent of hell, fire, and brimstone, brimstone being uh, uh, a smell intensified of many rotten eggs, if you will, uh, uh, even the scent of hell would cause you to want to regurgitate, but you cannot regurgitate because uh, the liquid would cool your tongue. Intense pain. There's the pain of hell. Many say they'll go to hell and party with their friends. There is no party going on in hell. Hell's so horrible, Jesus warned not to go there. The apostles warned not to go there. Many of preachers have warned not to go there, and I too warn you, do not go to hell. You don't have to go to hell. Jesus came and bled and died on the cross of Calvary, was buried and rose again under his own power, so you don't have to go to hell. He took your sin and he paid your sin debt. He took your hell, he took your death, and he conquered it all, so you wouldn't have to face the sting of death, nor the pain of hell. There's the pain of hell. There's also the punishment of hell. In Luke chapter 12, verse 47, Jesus, speaking on a parable, says, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. You know the Bible says it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But there are many people, Brother Ron, won't do God's will. It goes on to say this, but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Romans 14 verse 11 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Revelation 20 and 13 says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. 
Can I say, every person that rejects the Lord Jesus Christ and dies and goes to hell, because they will not let Jesus pay for their sins, will have to pay for their own sins. And every man will be judged according to his works, according to his sins. You see, God is keeping a record of all of us. And those that refuse the Lord Jesus Christ will be reminded of all their sins, uh, and to the degree of wickedness they lived in this life is, will amount to the degree of punishment they'll suffer in hell. There's the punishment of hell. There's the permanency of hell. In Revelation 14, verse number 10, the Bible says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into a cup, and his indignation, and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Matthew 25 verse 41 says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25 verse 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved from their sin, Brother Ray, we go to everlasting life. We go to a perfect environment where there is no more sin, where there is no more pain, where there is no more suffering, where there is no more death, where there is no more sorrow, where God himself shall wipe away the tears from our eyes. Uh, we'll live in a celestial city where the Lord himself is the light of the city. Uh, there'll be no more sun nor moon, no need for it. Uh, and we'll be with the Lord forevermore. Uh, Brother James will join that heavenly choir and sing unto the Lord, Worthy is the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. But those that reject the Lord, why we for all of eternity live in heavenly bliss for all of eternity, forever and ever, Brother Bob had said, they'll be punished in hell, the lake of fire. Friend, you don't have to go to hell. If you go to hell, it's because you choose to. As my last point, Brother Michael, is the path to hell. What's it take to go to hell? Well, Matthew chapter number 7 says, verse 13, Enter ye at the straight gate. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. The gate to hell is wide, and all you have to do to go there is nothing. Because the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We were conceived in sin. Can I say that because the first man sinned, sin was passed upon all men and death by sin. We were born sinners. And the only hope for sinners was the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who took away the sin of the world. And those that believe on the Lord and accept Him as their Lord and Savior, they'll be forgiven of their sins. But those who don't will die and go to hell. All you got to do to go to hell is nothing. Say, Brother Doug, what is the sin that sends you to hell? There's only one sin that sends people to hell. It's the sin of unbelief. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Mm -mm. There are a lot of people who will throw up all kinds of things why they can't be saved. The only thing that's going to send you to hell, friend, is unbelief. Mm. The only thing that will take you to heaven is to junk everything that you have believed and believe on the Lord. Just put your faith in Him. Throw yourself on the mercy of God. And He'll save you, my dear friends. He's promised to. He said, If any come to Him, He'd no wise cast you out. The path to, to, to hell is a wide gate that leadeth to destruction. And friend, all you got to do is nothing because you're already on that path. Hmm. But friend, you don't have to stay on that path. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. I read a story. 
about a fellow that lived a couple hundred years ago named Archibald Boyle. He was from Glasgow, Scotland. He was an atheist and an infidel. And he was a part of a very notorious club in Scotland at the time. And he was the ringleader of the club, Brother Josh. It was called the Hell Club. And they lived their lives in debauchery and wickedness. And they kept trying to outdo one another, see who could be more and more wicked. And whoever was the most wicked was the leader of the pack. And that was Archibald Boyle. There was nothing beyond his constraint that he wouldn't do. And nothing he wouldn't do to prove how wicked he really was. One night, after a drunken stupor, he went home. Went to bed that night. Brother Phil, he had a dream. The dream was so vivid and so real, he thought he was awake. The dream that he had... He was riding home on his black steed because he had a black horse because he was wicked. And while he's riding home, Brother Clint, a rider came up next to him, the rider that we would call the death angel, and grabbed the reins from his hand and began to uh, propel that horse to ride faster than it had ever ridden before. Insomuch that Mr. Boyle got scared he was going so fast on the horse. And all of a sudden, the horse went through a big gate and it ended up in a place called hell. Upon first looking around, he saw all of his friends. He says, well, this isn't too bad. Until he looked a little closer. And from the bosom of his friends, he saw the fire of hell. He saw the venom of the serpents of hell. He saw where mm, the worm dieth not. He saw the debauchery that on earth turned into the punishment in hell. He saw the flames and the horrors and the terrors. He was so taken back by the dream that when he woke up, Brother Jim, he was so shocked and so scared he refused to get out of the bed for three days. His buddies from the club rallied around him. He told them of the dream, and they began to mock, make fun, laugh. They began to compel him to get back to the club. They beat him down so much that he decided to return to his former ways. This was the quote that he said. He said, He could bear the wrath of the Almighty easier than the sneer of his fellows. The last night he was Saul, he mounted that horse, headed down the road toward home. The next day they found the horse standing next to his body. Rigor mortis had already started setting up. You see, he failed to heed the warning to not die and go to hell. This morning, I wonder if you'll heed the warning or if you'll reject it. You don't have to go to hell, friend. Amen. Jesus don't want you to die and go to hell. God don't want you to die and go to hell. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Can I say this church don't want you to die and go to hell. This preacher don't want you to die and go to hell. These, these dear folks, this church don't want you to die and go to hell. But make no mistake, if you do die and go to hell, it's by your own choosing. And you'll suffer for all of eternity. You'll remember this little message. You may even be next to Archibald Boyle when you get there. And for all of eternity, you'll remember the day you could have escaped that horrible place. But you chose the sneers of your fellows. 
over the wrath of the Almighty. Today, the Bible says it's the day of salvation. You can be saved today. Will you put your faith and trust in Jesus? In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. We're going to invite you to come. If you don't know the Lord, we'd love to introduce you to Him. Say, preacher, I don't know how to be saved. We'll take a Bible, show you what the Bible says about being saved. Being saved is simple. In order to be saved, you just need to realize you're lost. You need the Lord. And if you're willing to call on the Lord, He'll save you. If I was here today and I was a mom and daddy and had lost children, I'd be in the altar begging God to deal with them about their sins. If I had a brother or sister or an aunt or an uncle or a neighbor not saved, I'd, I'd sure touch heaven for them, ask God to save them so they don't die and go to hell. But I, if I was sitting here today and I wasn't saved, I wouldn't put it off any longer. Why don't you come? Give your life to Jesus. He gave his life for you. And he just wants you to live an abundant life in him. Folks are already coming. Let's all stand. Miss Renee, if you'll come. Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. While they're picking out a song and these are coming, let's have a word in prayer. Father, we sure do love you. Lord, I'm glad I'm not going to hell. I deserve to. I was a sinner. But Lord, you saved me and you forgave me of all my sins. You gave me a pardon from God. And Lord, I'm not going to, hell, going to hell. My name's been written down in heaven. But Lord, I fear there's somebody here this morning. They don't know you in the free pardon of sins. They might be a good moral person. But Lord, they've never been saved. I pray today would be the day of their salvation. I pray the sweet Holy Spirit of God through cords of love would draw them and let them know they don't have to die and go to hell. They can be saved today. Lord, I pray they'd come, give their life to Jesus. Lord, I pray for that heartbroken mama or daddy whose children are lost. God, you'd work in their children's lives that they'd be saved. Lord, I pray for any other need here today. Lord, that need be met in Christ. Now, God, send revival amongst your people with a burden to see people not die and go to hell. And Father, again, that one that's near as tell today, I pray that, Lord, you'd save them. And God will bless you and praise you for what you do. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.